well. But um, if you guys would just give him a big warm welcome from Anthem this morning, Trevor Gambin. Thanks, man. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, did I hear someone yell out Portlandia when Chris was asking? Oh, okay, yeah. That's, um, that show is it, it's too painfully true to watch unfortunately. Um, but anyways, it's good to be here with you guys. Um, it's a real honor and privilege to uh, be here. Um, I do want to just say, uh, I, I hope you know this, but you have uh, some of the best leaders in the entire world, um, your staff and, yeah, <clears throat> um, your staff and elders um, and leaders are among the best to be around. They love Jesus. They love you and talk about you guys a lot. And, um, and Chris has been a, a great friend and a mentor for me. So it's, um, it's really more than anything just an honor to be with you guys. Um, but if you, uh, if you have a Bible, we're going to be in Luke chapter 9. And we're continuing on in storyline. And what's great is our church in Portland, they met at 10 o'clock. And they are um, going through the same series. Uh, so we're doing storyline together. And they finished up Luke chapter 9 just a little bit ago as well, so it's fun to be able to do this together with you guys. But Luke chapter 9, give us a little bit of context of where we're at and where we're going. Uh, last week, uh, Pastor Chris taught um, and showed really the connection between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And I, as you guys have worked through Storyline, one of the things I, I'm sure you, you saw was the fact that the Old Testament really is screaming of a Savior or, or of a Messiah that's coming. And so we have judges that are raised up that are uh, delivering Israel. We have uh, prophets that are coming that are heralding the news that God is going to fix what is broken. He's going to right what's wrong, and he's going to bring uh, a messianic figure to do that. And then 400 years of nothing, of silence, no prophets, no visions, no dreams, no judges, silence. And the Israelites are in this place of longing and waiting and anticipating, and God's not speaking, seemingly not speaking. And I don't know about you, but if I feel like God hasn't spoken for four days, I begin to question my faith. But for 400 years, there's nothing, and then all of a sudden, John the Baptist comes onto the scene. And in Luke chapter 3 at verse 15, as John is coming and he's preparing a, the way for the Messiah, the people are looking to him, and it's, Luke records that they're saying, with expectation, are you the one? Are you the one who's going to fix this? Are you the Messiah? And the reality is we live in a day and age where you don't have to be religious or spiritual to see that there's something vastly wrong with our world. You just have to look at the news or look at the paper to see that things are broken. And so as John the Baptist comes onto the scene, he says, no, I'm coming to prepare the way for the Messiah. And in Luke 1 through 4, 1 through 6, we find out that that Savior is going to be Jesus. And so in the first six chapters, we have a preparation, an introduction to who the Messiah is going to be. We see Jesus' birth. We see his baptism. We see him sent out into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. And then we begin to see this um, kingdom start to come forward. We hear his teachings. We see his miracles. And so the question for you and I today is, who is Jesus? What is he like? What does he do? Because the reality is, is we are longing for redemption, we're longing for hope, we're longing for peace, we're longing for things to be fixed, and the, the day in which we live, we look most of the time everywhere else outside of the person and work of Jesus. And so, uh, I want to read a quote from C.S. Lewis um, from uh, Mere Christianity, um, maybe perhaps you're familiar with it, but he says this, he says, I'm trying here to prevent anyone from saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. This is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with a man who says he's a poached egg. Just for the record, I, I don't know what that means. I think I know what the rest of the quote means. I'm a little unfamiliar with the poached egg idea. Anyways, uh, on the level with a man who is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil in hell. You must make your choice. The claims that Jesus makes in the New Testament do not leave us to be able to have a position that he's a good guy, that he has good things to say and good pithy slogans and things that we can incorporate into our life, but he's not God, or he is. He's either crazy and we should dismiss him altogether, or he's 
the worst person that's ever been born who has been lying to people for thousands of years, or perhaps he is God. In my part of the city, uh, in Portland, we feel this um, really significantly, very acutely, that um, we see people that are longing for significance, purpose, value, and worth, salvation, all of those things, um, but they do not see it in Jesus. Um, And one of the things that we're seeing as a trend in, in our city in particular is this rise of what's called new atheism. And it's different from old atheism, which generally was about trying to deconstruct our faith and trying to show how it's unreasonable to believe in Christianity, how it's unreasonable to believe in God and things like that. And now there's been this shift towards what is called new atheism, where it's not about trying to take your faith away, but it's by showing that we can have lives that are just as good as yours without Jesus. We can have meaning and purpose and worth and longings fulfilled, and we're doing all of that without the dogma and the stigma of the Bible and of Jesus. And I'll give you an example. There's an author, a book that I read not too long ago called uh, Confessions of a Secular Jesus Follower. His name's Tom Krattenmaker. He's an award-winning columnist for USA Today. And in the book, he says, I have never been transformed by anyone more than the person of Jesus, but I am unequivocally not a Christian. And so he writes to people to show that we can get things from the Bible, that we can find all the things that we're looking for apart from Jesus. I'll read you a quote from what he says. He says, living life supposedly must lead despite the claims that without God, people are doomed to living life with no notion of right or wrong or bad or good. Why not just kill for sport? Most of us in this wildly diverse collection of non-religious, non-theistic individuals are managing just fine, more or less. We are demonstrating every day that godlessness does not lead to the horror that alarmist religion promoters warn about. We are, for the most part, people who enjoy our lives. We are, by and large, and imperfectly good citizens who tend to our responsibilities, take care of our kids, love our spouses and parents, and try to make the world a fairer and better place. By doing all of this, with our eyes open to our mortality and while harboring no sweet notion of heaven to console us, We're disproving that seculars crumble under the vast weight of supposed nothingness. And we're proving, as the pithy slogan of American Humanist Association puts it, that people and life can be good without God. And so the question for for you and I today is is one, if you're in here and um, you're not a person of faith, you're skeptical, you're trying to uh, figure it out, thank you so much for being here, and I hope that our time together will provide some satisfiable answers of who Jesus is. Um, But if you are in here and you are a believer, our view of Jesus dictates everything. Our expectation of Jesus, our understanding of Jesus, it dictates everything. Your identity, your purpose, your value, your worth, how you handle suffering, how you look to the future, how you deal with setback, how you deal with joy, it affects everything. And so what my hope is today as we look at Luke chapter 9, we see kind of this, this change, this shift in the, in, the, in the gospel of Luke where Jesus now shows us and tells us more about what his kingdom's like about what it means to understand who Jesus is, and let's, have to, let's see what he says. If you're um, in Luke 9, I'm going to start reading at verse 18, and, uh, and let's pick it up together. Verse 18, now it happened that as he was praying alone, the disciples were with him, and he asked them, who do the crowd say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist but others say Elijah, and others one of the prophets of old has risen. Then he asked Then he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, the Christ of God. So let's set the scene. Uh, Jesus is with his disciples. They are uh, in the area of Caesarea Philippi, and Jesus' fame has started to rise. He's a trending topic on Twitter. People are hearing about him. They know what he's doing, and they have a lot of questions. And so Jesus asks his guys, what is the word on the street? What do people say about me? Who do they think that I am? And the disciples respond by saying, I wish we had more time to get into this, but um, the disciples respond by saying, some think you're John the Baptist, some think you're Elijah, and some think you're one of the prophets. And what are they, in essence, articulating? They're all agreeing that people think Jesus is pretty different than anybody else, that he articulates a message that is vastly different from the rest of the world, that he does things that are different than the rest of the world, that he has a power that's different from the rest of the world. But what's the one thing that they leave out about him being God? So Jesus, we think you're 
impressive. We think you're articulate. We can't quite understand the miracles that have happened thus far, but we don't think that you're God. And then famously, Peter stands up when Jesus asks him, who do you say that I am? Which I love about Christianity and Jesus is he gets very personal, very quick with us. The question is not so much about what the crowd say, but it's what you say and I say about who Jesus is. And he says, he says to the guys, who do you guys say that I am? And Peter responds by saying, you're the Christ. You are the Son of God. And Peter affirms him, says that's, that's right, but here's, here's where I want to camp out for a couple minutes. Jesus, or Peter does affirm that Jesus is the Son of God, but he's actually missing the point almost entirely. And what I mean by that is this. If you take a look at verse 21, Jesus says this, and he strictly charged and commanded them to tell no one, saying the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised from the grave. In Matthew's account, in Matthew 16, we get to see more of a, a longer dialogue that takes place. And what we see is that Peter affirms that Jesus is who he says he is. And then Jesus says, the way in which I'm going to bring in my kingdom is through death. And Peter rebukes him. For the record, it's not usually a good idea to rebuke God. But Peter says, there's no way that you're going to the cross and that you're going to die. There's absolutely no way. And why would Peter think that way? Because Peter's expectation of Jesus as the Messiah is that he's going to triumph. Saviors win. Saviors don't lose. Saviors don't die. And why does Peter think that way? Well, he's been with him for a relatively short time, and he's seen Jesus do incredible miracles seen him raise someone from the dead. He see him heal people. And when he looks back in the Old Testament, he sees in the, uh, in the Davidic line that Jesus is coming out of David's kingly line. So of course he's not going to lose. Of course he's not going to die. He's a savior. He's a king. He's going to overthrow the Roman occupation. The disciples are in on the ground floor of this new kingdom that's going to come in and change everything. They're finally going to get that corner office that they've been hoping for. And so Peter, as he hears this, says there's no way that that's going to happen. Saviors don't die. They win. But what's Jesus doing? Jesus is communicating to us that the way in which he is going to bring in his kingship is through death. It's subversive. And the expectation that Peter has of Jesus is that he's going to come and conquer He will, but not on his first time coming. And so Jesus speaks this subversive message to his followers to say, the way that I'm going to bring in forgiveness, redemption, is through my death. What I love about Christianity so much is the depth in which the Bible goes to unpack our human condition said in the beginning that largely the Old Testament is this. It is screaming out that something has gone terribly wrong and that God is going to fix it. And when Jesus comes, the way in which he communicates he's going to fix it is vastly deeper than you and I usually look. Our issues are not just things that self-help is going to fix. It's not just saying that the economy is going to fix. It's not just saying social constructs are going to fix. The thing that is most deeply wrong with us and what affects us the most is sin. And that's not a very popular message, Uh, certainly in my city, that's like a cuss word, that's that's not a good word to talk about that, but Jesus gets to the deep issue, And and I'll give you an example of this. The reason why we find ourselves the way that we are, our country, our state, our world, is because of sin. But when all of this originated, God had in mind, he created you and I perfectly and intentionally without sin. I'll give you this picture in Genesis 1 and 2. God decides to create man in his image and likeness, which I just want to encourage you. Um, You are not here by accident. Um, You were not a product of a big bang that took place billions of years ago that somehow spun all of this into existence, and by random chance of the universe and happenstance, you're here today. But rather, God created you personally and intimately and loves you. 
We're not here by accident. We're not here by mistake. And so the picture in Genesis 1 and 2 that we get is three things, what we see about humanity. They had perfect harmony with God, perfect harmony with themselves, and perfect harmony with the world. In Genesis 1 and 2, we see that God creates man in his own image and likeness, and that they could walk with God in the cool of the day. They could see God. They could touch God. They could smell God. They were with him in perfection. We see that they had perfect harmony with themselves and with each other. They were able to be naked and unashamed. There was no fear. There was no uh, image issues. There was no self-consciousness. There was no guilt. There was no shame. There was none of that. They could be exactly who they are with each other. No walls were being built up. No backbiting was happening. And then we see that they had perfect harmony with the world. There was no disease, no sickness, no death, no injustice, no wars, no racism. They were actually able to name animals rather than being mauled by animals, which I think is cool. It's weird things that I think about when I prepare. But perfect. <clears throat> they could see God, touch God, listen to God, be with God. There was no issues personally with themselves. They were naked and unashamed, and the world was perfect. And then in Genesis 3, God's enemy comes in, and he delivers an alternative message. And it, what, in essence, is the message that Satan delivers? That God does not actually love you, but that he's trying to hold you down. He's trying to limit your freedom. He's trying to control you. He's not after your joy. He's after your begrudging submission. And if you eat from this tree... You're going to be like God in a way that God does not want you to be like him. And so this message is not for your joy. It's not for your deep longing and purpose. It is to control you, which at this point, they had no reason to doubt the character and the nature of God's word. But rather than listening to God, they listened to the enemy, and for the first time, brokenness enters into the cosmos. And so they go from harmony with God, with themselves and with others, to brokenness with God. What's the first thing that happens after they sin? They hear God coming, and what do they do? They run. They flee from Him. They're afraid of what God's going to do or what God is going to say. So rather than running to God because they remember His loving embrace and that the relationship they have, they run from God. And then they realize that they're naked for the first time, and they, they have to cover up. They clothe themselves. Why? Because shame now has entered in. Guilt has entered in. And then immediately after, they blame each other for what happened. God comes and says, what, what just happened? And Adam says, it's the wife that you gave me. Classic line. Um, it's the wife that you gave me. Before one flesh, perfect intimacy, now it's her fault. And then she says, no, now it's, it's Satan's fault. And then what they had with perfect harmony with the world is now broken. Death enters in, decay enters in, sin enters in, sickness enters in, war enters in, and we find ourselves right in the middle of that. Brokenness with God, brokenness with self, brokenness with the rest of the world. And we feel this. You don't have to be a religious person to feel this. It is hard to believe in God sometimes. You can't see him. You can't touch him. There's times for me when I look in the Bible and I look outside and I don't see how those things act up. I don't see how those things are right. I don't understand how God can be good all of the time and allow the certain things that happen in our world to happen. It's a challenge to believe at times. I don't have right relationship with myself. There's issues of depression, of insecurity, of self-loathing, of fights and uh, walls that come up in relationships. And there isn't right relationship with the rest of the world. There's a fear of a, of a conflict with North Korea. What about the economy? What about uh, the relative that's sick? What about bills? Are we going to have enough money for Christmas? What about all of this? And Jesus enters into that story, and he says, I am going to fix all of this. But it's going to be through my death and through my resurrection. The sin that entered into this world is so pervasive the debt is so high that the only way for things to be fixed is through God's Son dying on the cross. 
And so Jesus says, I'm going to fix this. I'm going to redeem it. And this is how my kingdom is going to come, through my death, burial, and resurrection. And then he invites us into his kingdom as well by saying this. Take a look at verse 23. He says, um, and he said to all of them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? So what does Jesus say next? Here's how my kingdom is going to come. Here's how I am going to redeem. Here's how I am going to fix all these things. It's not going to be through uh, taking out the Roman Empire. It's not going to be through a mighty political campaign. It's going to be subversive. It's going to be through my death, my burial, and resurrection. And if you want to be a part of this kingdom, it's going to be by your death too. It's going to be by death to self. And what I was thinking about this is why does Jesus, Jesus in essence, he's communicating a paradox. If you want life, you need to die, which doesn't make much sense to us. But why does he have to communicate it like this? Well, back in Genesis 1, all God had to do was to say, this is the life that I've given you. It's perfect. Enjoy it. Tend to the field. Eat of it. I will be here. It's perfect. And now, because of the message of Satan, what feels like life to us is actually death. And what feels like a death to us is actually where we find life. So Jesus comes with a counterintuitive message. If you want redemption, if you want freedom, it's actually going to come from death to self. Uh, Where I live uh, in Portland, when we talk about this, when I talk about this to people over coffee or whatever the case may be, and we're talking about Jesus, and we're talking about what it means to follow Jesus, Um, When I communicate something like this to uh, most of of my friends in Portland, you know what they hear? God's trying to hold me down. He's trying to limit my freedom. He's trying to be a buzzkill. He's trying to uh, to make my life harder. It's almost the same message that is told in Genesis 3, that God is trying to keep you down. He's not trying to give you life. He is trying to make it harder, not easier. He He is trapping you, not giving you freedom. And so when we hear this message, it actually feels like a death. The reason being, I think, is because what has happened now, and we're, it, we're, we're in an interesting time of life where, uh, especially in the city that I live in, where people are leaving the churches in droves. Um, you may or may not know that, that Portland is one of the least church cities in all of America, and people actually flock to Portland to get away from religious people. Uh, that's a quote from someone, uh, one of my friends. And so what happens is when people come to Portland, they're in essence uh, so many times trying to create this utopia that has no God, no religion, and all has to do with ourselves. We'll fix our own problems. We'll, we'll right all the wrongs. We'll take care of the justice issues. We'll take care of equality. To fix what's going on in our lives, it takes us. And that's the message, the predominant message that we hear a lot of times in our culture. Um, Andrew Del Blanco wrote a, a book a number of years ago. Um, he's a Jewish psychologist, and it's, the book title is called The Real American Dream, A Meditation on Hope. And in it, he talks about, uh, he has three sections, and he talks about, in essence, where we've placed our hope spiritually as Americans. And he breaks his book down into three sections, uh, God, country, and self. And he says, basically, in essence, when, we, uh, when our country first started, we broke away from Britain, we had Judeo-Christian values that led us to put our hope in God, our belief in God. And then as time went on and we, we won a couple of world wars, there was this, um, there was this passionate uh, plea for hope in our country. And it, it became this thing where if you were an American, you were obviously a Christian, and if you were a Christian, you were obviously an American. And so we started to place all of our hope in our country. And then Del Blanco writes, he says, where, we, where he thinks we find ourselves now is the most fragile spot where we're looking for all of our hope in ourselves. And what happens when we don't have a standard, like God, like the Bible, and everything is found in you and I, well, then what's true for you is true for you, and right for you is right for you, and right for me is right for me, which is why I think we're renegotiating almost every institution in our country right now. 
the renegotiation of what marriage means, of what gender means, of what equality means, all these things are because rather than looking outside of ourselves to God and to Jesus for hope and for salvation, and for redemption, we just look to ourselves. The problem with that is it never works. There is nobody who lies to you more than you lie to you. And almost any time we try to go inward to fix all of our outward problems, it rarely works the way we want it to. And so Jesus comes and says, I'm going to fix this. I'm going to redeem this. This is what my kingdom is going to look like. This is what it means to be a part of the kingdom. It's going to be through my death, through my burial and resurrection. Your issues are not just in the economy, are not just in these areas, but it's in your deepest part that you are disconnected from God. And I have come to bring that connection back, to restore what has been broken. If we had more time, we'd keep going through the chapter to see that almost at every turn, his disciples are, are blowing it. Uh, they have the wrong expectations of who Jesus is and who he's supposed to be and what he's going to look like. So at various points, they're arguing about who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom, who gets to sit at his left hand, who gets to sit at his right hand. Uh, they don't think that he should die still, and there's all this thing going back and forth. They don't, uh, they don't understand exactly who Jesus is. But at the end of the chapter, we meet four different people. And I want to focus in on this as, as our last kind of point to talk about um, or to ask the question, what is your expectation of Jesus? What's your view of Jesus? What expectation do you have on him for your life? And I think with these four um, individuals here, we could actually find ourselves in at least one of them. One of the categories that we can, we can see them, we should be able to find ourselves in, and, and let's see what Jesus has to say to that. So if you take a look at verse um, 49, I'm going to read uh, through the rest of the chapter, and then we'll unpack it. Verse 49, John answered, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he does not follow with us. But Jesus said to him, Do not stop him, for the one who is not against you is for you. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers ahead of him who went and uh, entered a village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him. But the people did not receive him because his face was set towards Jerusalem. He was on his way to the cross. And when his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them, and they went on to another village. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord. But first let me say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom. So four, four individuals that we see have an encounter with Jesus. Here's the first. Uh, we'll, we'll call them the controlling followers. In verse 54 uh, through 56, the disciples come back to Jesus, and I think they come back pretty excited about this. They go, Jesus, we saw someone who doesn't share our members only jacket, and they were casting out demons, and we shut them up. And then there's another village that doesn't, um, that doesn't bring Jesus in, and they want to call down fire. And they're looking to Jesus like, did we not do the right thing here? And what does Jesus say? He rebukes them and says, I came to seek and save that which is lost. If they're not against us, they're for us. And the big idea here is that is your ex expectation of Jesus as the rule-following, sin-crushing, only-like-us way of Jesus that there's only really one way to follow Jesus, there's only one way to do Christianity right, there's only one way to do church right, and anybody outside of that is doing it wrong. Jesus comes to blow up that category, to say if they're not against us, they're for us. So do you view Jesus as the one who's just coming to uh, tell everyone that they're a sinner, 
and that they're doing wrong and they need to fix it and they need to get out if they're not going to do it the way we do it. Second is the concerned follower. In verse 57 through 58, uh, there's a man who comes to Jesus and he says, I will follow you wherever you go. And interestingly enough, Jesus responds by saying, foxes have holes to sleep in, birds of uh, the air have nests to nest in, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And the question is, why would Jesus respond like that? And the way that Luke writes it is that this man had the idea that if he followed Jesus, life would get so much better. Because Jesus has done miracles, he's going to heal, and so if I just follow Jesus, my bank account will never get empty, be empty, nobody will ever get sick, I'll never lose my job, life is going to be perfect from here on out. And how does Jesus respond? That sin is still pervasive, and even the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. One of the things that I love about Jesus is that he loves people so much, but he also doesn't, he doesn't lower the bar for people either. This man was looking for Jesus to fix everything. This was his expectation. And Jesus doesn't really play nice with some of these things. He just says, this is how it is. It actually might get harder for you if you follow me. It's going to be well worth it, the longing and the, 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 the life that you're longing to have will be met here, and the future that I give you will be well worth it, but it might actually get harder. And so, let me ask you, have, have, do you feel like you've been robbed by Jesus? Because your expectation might have been that Jesus should have come through in this way for you, and he didn't. I feel that all the time that I don't understand why Jesus allowed this to happen or God allowed this to happen and didn't come through. And then I remember most, most of the time my expectation is that Jesus is just gonna make my life all that much better and easier. But the problem is sin is still very real and he hasn't fixed everything for good and this is a part of following Jesus. It's worth it, but it's challenging. Three is a conflicted follower. Uh, this man comes to Jesus and uh, Jesus says to follow me and he responds by saying, uh, let me first go back and bury my father. Now, what he's not talking about is, hey, the funeral is this weekend. Let me go do the funeral, be with my family, and then I'll come right back and I'm ready to follow you. Uh, culturally, what he's saying is his dad might not actually die for maybe a few years. He's saying there might be, there's something wrong and he might die soon, but it's probably going to be a while. And in that culture, too, uh, a funeral could last, in essence, upwards to a year. And so what is, what is this man saying? He's saying, uh, let me finish college and I'll get serious about you. Uh, let me get the kids out of the house before I get serious about following you. Let me take care of the debt that I need to take care of to follow you. Let me get this raise and this promotion that I need to work hard and then I will give you my life. And what does Jesus respond? Let the dead bury their dead. It's not that he doesn't show honor for family or anything like that, he certainly does but he's calling out the excuse of saying, hey, let me finish these things and then I'll get serious for you. I promise. And then lastly, we see the complacent follower. This man comes to Jesus. Jesus asks him to follow him and he says, let me go um, say goodbye to my friends first. I got some people I need to go say goodbye to. Let them know about the life change, the move, send them my new phone number, mailing address, those things. Let them know what's going on. But what's this man saying? What I think he is saying is this. I'm not quite ready to give up my life to follow you. So I'm going to need to hang on to my porn addiction for a little bit longer. I'm going to need to hang on to maybe this specific sin of anger, of jealousy, of whatever the case may be, for a little bit longer. Let me hang on to giving all of my time to fantasy football, and let me just finish the season. And the question for you and I is, what do you think is better than Jesus? This is, let me, let me go and deal with this, and then, and then when I finish it, then I'll come back. And in essence, what he's saying is it's open-ended. It's like, I don't know if I'm ever going to be able to say goodbye to these guys well enough or take care of this well enough, but if I do, then I promise I'll come back to you. Is your expectation that this world is better than Jesus? One of the commentators on this passage said this. He said, in plowing a field in that day, 
A farmer kept the rows straight by focusing on an object in front and in the distance, such as a tree. If the farmer started to plow and kept looking behind, he would never make straight rows and do a good job of plowing. If following Jesus, we are to keep our eyes on Jesus and never take our eyes off of him. No plowman ever uh, plowed a straight line looking back over his shoulder. The message of Jesus is subversive. The way the kingdom has come in is countercultural, is paradoxical to us. It is death by life, but it is better. And it is what you and I are deeply, deeply longing for. But the challenge is the message of our culture still today is one that it is all to be found in yourself. And the message of God is that it's all to be found in Jesus. And so here's where I wanna, what I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you to think through what is your expectation of Jesus? Is he, the, is he the rule follower, the sin crusher? Is he the only one that we can be with? Are there things in your life that you need to take care of first? Is he not the first priority? Are you conflicted about leaving things to follow Jesus? Are you complacent about following Jesus? Who's your expectation? What's your expectation of Jesus? And maybe today is a good day to come and to ask for forgiveness for Jesus and to say, this is the expectation I had of you. This is the view I had of you. But the view of Jesus in the Bible is far greater. And it's far better to follow him and to serve him and to lose for him because the reality is we have the hope of the future. See, the message of Genesis 3 is that our relationship with God is broken. So rather than run to him, you should run from him. You shouldn't come near to him. He's angry at you. He knows what you've done, and he's upset at you. The message of Jesus is, I have come for you. So you come to me. Bring all the hurt. Bring all the sin. Bring all the insecurity. Bring the depression. Bring the uh, self-esteem issues. Bring all of that to me, and I will fix that. The message of Genesis 3 is, you are broken. There is shame. So you need to do whatever you can to fix yourself. The message of Jesus is I have come to redeem that. So I will give you a new identity that is not contingent upon how good you think you are. I will give you a new identity that's not contingent upon how beautiful you think you are. I will give you an identity that holds up when you lose your job or when someone gets sick. I will give you hope. And Genesis 3 is that the world is broken, and Jesus says, I have come to redeem it. So there's a day coming, like Revelation 21 says, that there will be no need for a son. Jesus will stand in the middle of the people, in, our, in the midst of the people. There will be no more sickness, no more death, no more decay, no more disease, no more war, no more famine, no more injustice, no more races, none of that. All of that will be dealt with. But the message for all of that to happen is found in the person in of Jesus Christ. And so my encouragement for you and I today is for you to come to Jesus. If you you doubt God, if you don't believe in God, if you you feel the brokenness between you and God, come to him today and admit that, acknowledge it, and see what Jesus might do. If you are struggling with brokenness inside, depression, uh, anxiety, uh, any any other issue, I want you to come to Jesus because he speaks to that and he's the only one that has the power to change that. And if you're nervous about your future, about anxiety, about what's going to happen, about the world being broken, I want to encourage you to come to Jesus because he said, I am going to fix this and I'm going to redeem all of this. Why, the reason why I think Christianity is so far better than secularism or humanism is because no other philosophy and no other religion can touch the message of Christianity that you will get a new identity, a new hope, a new savior, a new future, and there's coming a day where all of this will be fixed. And that's why we look forward to Christmas because God's going to come in an unexpected way through a baby in a manger. And the message of Christianity continues to be paradoxical, continues to be subversive, but all of this will be fixed and he invites us to come to him. Let me pray for us. God, thank you so much for um, our time together. And um, thank you, Jesus, for your kingdom that has been breaking in 
for a couple thousands of years, and we get hints and shadows of it. We see when you heal people. We see when you go to people we would never go to and uh, speak with people that we would never speak with and uh, love people that are seemingly unlovable, that you are showing us that the kingdom is breaking forward. And God, I do pray for anyone who does not know you today that you would move by your spirit to show that everything they're looking for is ultimately wrapped up in the person and work of Jesus. And I pray for us too, God, if our expectation of you is anything but what we see in the scriptures, that you would blow that up today and help us to see the real Jesus, that you love us, that you died for us, that while we were still yet sinners and enemies to you, you came to save us and that you have gone to prepare a place for us, and that one day you will bring us all together and fix everything. And so help us to be agents of change in the world, to deliver a message that is unlike anything else in the universe. We love you, God. We are thankful for you, Jesus. We need you. It's for your beautiful name we pray. Amen.